to Tea Science Tuesday, and today we're going to talk about climate change and tea. Uh, which cake am I drinking? What tea am I drinking? I'm drinking the uh, Ye Sheng from Dehong. Um, this is just like a white label cake, a uh, little mini one from Yunnan Sourcing. It's delicious. It's a, a Sheng Pour uh, from 2014, I think. I love it. It's so good. Um, and we're going to talk about today uh, a little bit about how um, the climate is affecting, climate change is affecting tea quality, and that's going to include um, how it's going to affect, how, or how it is already affecting uh, poor tea. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, if you're confused, sorry, I did change the schedule like last minute. Um, it just really like last minute, like yesterday. I was away for the weekend. I was in Corning, New York, um, just on a fun trip. Hello, welcome, Tea Curious, cool. Yeah, I was gone in Corning uh, just for like a fun trip to go see the Corning Glassware Museum. And uh, on my way back, on like the bus back from my mom's house, I was like, oh shoot, Tea Science Tuesday. And I, I had originally on the schedule albino tea, um, which we already kind of, kind of talked about in the last one uh, on, on theanine, which I will put up on YouTube today or tomorrow um, as I have time. And um, I thought, okay, I already kind of talked about that. And then I think the next one up was um, fermented teas. And, you know, I didn't feel prepared. And I want to give the people a good, a good show. Um, and so I thought, well, you know what? I'll switch it to something easy um, or that should be easy um, is climate change, the effects of climate change on tea. And so that's um, sort of the big umbrella topic that my PhD dissertation and my research falls under. And so I thought, you know, I should be able to talk about that off the top of my head and be relatively interesting without a whole lot of prep. <laughs> so that's that's full full honesty there, full transparency. Um, I didn't prep a whole lot for this. Um, but while I was in Corning, uh, I tried to make some tea there. I brought tea with me. I like to bring, you know, tea with me when I travel. Um, I brought this uh, Yunnan green tea that I've really been into lately um, that I also got from Yunnan Sourcing. And um, I love it. It's like one of my favorite green teas. It's like super bold. It's, uh, it's just like really packs a punch. It's got great aroma. Um, and then uh, I brewed it with the very hard water in Corning, New York. And it was the grossest green tea I've ever had. Like it was really bad. Just like pretty flavorless, but the flavor that was there was just like really vegetal and it was gross. And it just made me remember like when people say to you, Oh, I don't like tea. Um, maybe their water sucks, you know. And and tea legitimately tastes bad if you're if you're brewing it with bad water. So hey, hey Andy, welcome. Um, yeah. So it, it that inspired me to add a uh, topic to the Tea Science Tuesday calendar. Um, uh, so eventually, I'm going to talk about water and the effects of water chemistry on brewing tea. And I hope. I hope I can uh, have some time to, to prep a little bit more for that one and do some interesting things. Maybe I'll try to do like a, 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 a sort of single blind tasting of water or something um, on that. Anyway, so that's, that's my story. That's my excuse for why we're switching up the schedule a little bit. Um, but I hope, I hope I'll, it'll be interesting to you. So um, climate change, uh, what is it? So you're all probably familiar with the warming part of it, right? Global warming. Um, so why am I saying climate change and not global warming? They're not totally synonymous. Um, climate change encompasses all the sorts of effects um, that are happening to the climate, um, which includes, um, uh, includes warming. And... Um, but it also includes changes to precipitation and changes to um, the, the uh, frequency of sort of extreme weather events. Um, so storms, um, you've probably noticed in your lifetime here, have been becoming more and more frequent. Um, droughts have, becoming, have, have started becoming more and more frequent. And things like sea level rise also fall into that category of climate change. Um, and, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how those things are affecting tea and how they might affect tea in the future, for better or for worse, um, a little bit of both maybe. Um, so uh, drought is where I'll start. Um, so that the actual warming itself uh, is probably not going to have the biggest impact on tea, 
on its own. Um, you know, tea plants, they, they can grow in pretty warm regions um, as long as it's wet. And so that's where this is important, right? So the, the effects of the heat on its own are not going to really affect tea, but of course those things are not on their own. The heat isn't the only thing that's happening. Um, so drought has been a big issue in India in particular um, in recent years where um, droughts have actually been bad enough that they have um, not only like impacted the yields of crops, but also killed plants, killed tea plants. And that's a, that's a really big deal for tea farmers because tea plants are really long lived. They can um, live, they, they usually, tea farmers usually don't replace tea plants for until they're like 50 years old at least um, is, is, what I, is what I've heard um, is my impression from talking to tea farmers. Uh, maybe you guys have different ideas and that are listening and watching on the live stream, but um, you know, 50 year old tea plant, um, that's all, that's a, so that's a huge investment when you plant a tea plant and you plan to keep it around for 50 years. Um, and if you get a drought and you know, even half your plants die, um, that can be a huge, huge uh, uh, impact on a tea farmer. So um, one of the things, what, some of the research that, um, so, so one of the, the, the team members that's uh, doing this sort of collaborative research with me um, is a, a professor at Montana State, Selena Ahmed. And um, some of her work has looked at the effects of um, drought on tea. And there's also a really great book, a really great um, team in the UK headed by Ellie, Dr. Ellie Biggs. And um, they've done a lot of great work on drought in India. Um, one of the things uh, that we sort of know is that um, tea plants that are planted clonally, that are planted from cuttings, are not as good at dealing with drought um, as tea plants that are grown from seed. Tea plants that are grown from seed tend to, tend to have deeper root systems, um, and so they can tap into that groundwater that's deeper down. So I was thinking about this earlier today, you know, why, why isn't, you know, why isn't the advice, well, the farmers should just all plant from seed. Um, so there's a, there's a couple, you know, this is where it gets complicated. Um, so one advantage of planting your field clonally is that uh, all the plants are then genetically identical if you plant them from cuttings. And that means they're all gonna grow leaves, new leaves at basically exactly the same time. And that's super, super important if you wanna mechanize production in any way. So if you wanna use, you know, sort of the, the hedge trimmer kind of harvesters, I don't know if you guys have seen these, but they're, they have these harvesters that are like one or sometimes two people holding onto basically a hedge trimmer and walking along the rows of these tea, tea plants and then it picks up the leaves in a bag. If you wanna do anything like that, your tea plants all have to be synchronized. Otherwise you're gonna get a mix of young leaves and old leaves, which is gonna make it difficult to process and gonna make a poor quality tea. So if you plant tea from seed, you get a mix of genetics. Tea is not true breeding, it's kind of like apples. If you were to plant an apple seed from a Fuji apple, you would not get a Fuji apple tree. You would get some weird crab apple thing. Um, and every seed from that apple would grow into a totally different tree that would produce slightly different apples. Um, tea is the same way. So, um, so when farmers plant by seed, you can't get that synchronization and it doesn't allow for any kind of mechanization and everything has to be hand-picked, uh, pretty much. Um, and so that's an issue of sort of social justice um, to think about, because in India, um, tea, tea pickers are, are paid, in many places at least, very, very low, like close to slave wages. Um, and so telling farmers to you know, switch their production to seeds because they'll be more resilient to drought has these other effects on the 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 uh, economics of tea and on the the sort of social justice aspect of um, of the conditions of the tea workers. Let me just see. Andy has a, qu a question here. Drought killed tea plants in central South Taiwan in early spring this year while irrigation was not available. Wow. So I it's, I didn't realize it was a problem in um, in Taiwan at all. Also, so yeah, that's news to me. So that's not great. Um, if uh, Taiwan, which is generally a, a wetter place, um, 
as far as tea growing regions go, uh, is also exper experiencing drought. It's not, that's not a super great sign. Andy, do you know if those were, if those tea plants were clonal or if they were um, planted from seed? I would be kind of interested to, to know. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, in places where, you know, yeah, minimal, but it happened, yeah. No, I, I definitely believe it. And they were clonal, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, a little bit of turnover is probably something that farmers, an expense that farmers, most farmers can sort of absorb and, and replant those areas of their field. Um, but, you know, major drought uh, kill, you know, deaths of tea plants is, is, a, is a big deal. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else was I going to talk about? Uh, yeah, so, so in addition to drought, um, you know, other changes in precipitation are happening in other parts of the world. So that's the thing, you know, climate warming, the warming isn't going to be uh, uniform across the globe, but it's more or less warming. Precipitation, on the other hand, some places are getting drier, some places are getting wetter. Um, and uh, the places that are getting wetter are not always getting wetter uniform across the year. So one example of that is um, Yunnan province, China, where they get seasonal monsoon rains. Um, and so the, the monsoons there are really important for tea farmers. And they're also, you know, maybe important to some tea consumers. Hold on, I'm going to boil some more water here. Try to move my kettle away so it doesn't get picked up in the microphone. Um, yeah, so uh, monsoon rains, right? So normally in Yunnan, they get monsoon rains during the summer. And so you probably have seen like spring harvest poor teas and you maybe have seen autumn harvest poor teas. One of my friends uh, really likes autumn harvest poor tea and recently convinced me to get some uh, to split a cake with him. And it's definitely different tasting than the spring tea, um, but it's good. Um, but you've probably not as often seen monsoon harvest, summer harvest poor tea. And that's because um, during that monsoon season, tea farmers typically don't bother even harvesting. Um, or if they do, I'm guessing probably it, it gets, uh, it goes into like shoe poor production, ripe poor production, or, you know, other sort of lower quality um, uh, teas. Um, and so, oops. So again, this, this, uh, this, this project that I'm part of, um, by the way, if you want to learn more about this project that I'm part of, it's called, you can go to tclimate.org. That's our website. And there's, it's not super up to date, but there's um, links to a lot of different articles about uh, the, the research that um, the different members of this team have been doing. Um, and so before I started as a PhD student, some of the work that uh, the team had done was on um, the effects of the monsoon rains in Yunnan province and why does it make the quality so much worse. And it's really interesting because when those monsoon rains come, it actually improves the yield uh, or the potential yield of the tea. The tea plants grow bigger, they grow faster, the leaves, each individual leaf grows larger on average and they grow more leaves um, with the rain, which makes sense, right? Tea plants like rain, plants like rain, they, they grow when it's raining. Uh, but the quality changes a lot. Um, there's sort of like a dilution effect that goes on with uh, some of the chemicals we've talked about in previous Tea Science Tuesdays, like caffeine and theanine and the, the catechins in tea, those all sort of get diluted, they go down in concentration. And so that affects the flavor of the tea. And the volatile compounds change um, in the way that you'd sort of expect if you had tasted both monsoon and spring harvest poor, if you've tasted those both before, the monsoon harvest teas tend to have a lot more sort of vegetal notes, green notes, um, whereas the spring harvest tends to have a lot more floral, um, vol floral smelling volatiles, sweet smelling volatiles. Um, and so, uh, so the monsoon rains are bad for the quality of tea. And how does this relate to climate change? Well, um, under climate change, the monsoon rains have been and will be arriving earlier and lasting longer on average. And so this is, you know, bad news if you're a farmer in Yunnan province. And what do you do with, uh, do you, you know, 
how does that gonna how is that gonna play out? How are the economics of that gonna play out, right? So we've had this bubble um, in uh, in poor uh, prices already, um, and so now you know we've got a, a, a narrowing window of production possibly, um, and so it's sort of there's a little bit of uncertainty of what's what's gonna happen there um, for tea farmers in Yunnan, and I don't have the answers for that. I'm not an economist. I can't even guess what's going to happen. One of the things that I was interested in as sort of a side project, which maybe I'll get around to doing someday, is um, looking at how the climate change would affect the fermentation and the chemistry of a ripe poor tea. So I know that it affects the, the mao cha, the, the sort of unfinished tea. Um, we know that there is a difference between the spring and the monsoon tea from the same exact farm, same exact plants. Um, but do they ferment differently? And if they do, um, does that exacerbate the quality differences or does it make those teas more similar to each other after they're fermented? So this was an idea that I had and um, it's just sort of ran out of time uh, as it goes with uh, PhD projects. And it's uh, something that maybe I'll do uh, later on down the road and try to answer that question. Um, but making shupur is maybe one way that farmers can sort of recoup some of their losses during the monsoon season. I imagine that many farmers are already doing that with monsoon harvest tea, but maybe there's some room to make some high quality monsoon harvest shoe pour. I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So I talked about drought, talked about monsoons. Um, and then my research, uh, oh, by the way, Hello to the god of tea, welcome. Um, I did see you wave. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about my research too, which I've sort of done before. Um, I'll talk, tell you about some new things or some, uh, some, some different things that I haven't talked about yet. Um, so what I'm really interested in is how insects affect the quality and the chemistry of tea. And so a lot of my research has been on bug-bitten teas like Eastern Beauty Oolong. Um, and the connection to climate change there, uh, the reason that this fits in this sort of umbrella project of how does climate change affect tea, is that one of the indirect effects of climate change is that it's likely to cha make, have changes, have impacts on insect populations. And those insects then, you know, feed on plants, and so that's going to affect the plants and their chemistry because they will, you know, defend themselves with chemicals. Um, and he says, monsoons sound similar to summer crops being made into black tea here in recent years. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Um, so is that a, uh, you know, this isn't good enough to be a, a, a high quality Tiekwan Yen, so we'll make a black tea kind of situation? Um, that's really interesting to me because one of the things that um, these bug bitten teas like Eastern Beauty Oolong, they to me are a way for, they seem like a great way for farmers to sort of rescue an otherwise low quality crop during the summertime. Uh, the summer months are not as, it's uh, the, the tea quality is not as good, regardless of where you are, even if there's not monsoons, um, tea is better in the spring. Um, and so during the summer and the farm that I worked on in Fujian province, um, most people in that area were sort of making kind of export quality um, oolong. And so this was a lower quality tea. Um, they didn't get as much money for it. It went into sort of bottled drinks, ready to drink sort of things, or, you know, to places that made boba or whatever like that. Um, but if they just sort of allow leafhoppers to come and attack their crop, um, they can improve the quality of their tea, and uh, even though their yield goes down a bit, their prices, their wholesale prices go up, and they're able to, to make more money. Yeah, oh, interesting. So higher astringency in the summer, which is better for highly oxidized tea types. Interesting, cool. So that was from uh, Andy, by the way, for those of you watching later on YouTube. Um, uh, Iko Cha, Andy, had, uh, had some experience with uh, farmers in Taiwan doing the same kind of thing. In the summer months, uh, when the tea quality is otherwise low, they're going to switch production to some different type of tea, like black teas, um, to take advantage of the changes in the tea chemistry. 
So what, do, what does bug bitten tea have to do with climate change? Well, I already mentioned, you know, lower quality tea during the summer. Um, if those summer months get hotter, get longer, um, then strategies like making Eastern Beauty Oolong bug bitten teas or making black teas, you know, that's maybe the way to go for farmers. Um, but I'm also interested in it because these, these leaf hoppers are predicted to really benefit from climate warming. So right now in, in like China and Fujian province in Taiwan, they can have nine to 15 generations per year. So a generation is like a couple weeks <laughs> where they, lay, they hatch from an egg, grow to an adult, lay eggs, right? In just a couple of weeks. And so every time that cycle happens, every time they go through their life cycle, they have the potential to increase their numbers. So the, the, longer, the longer amount of time they have, um, the greater chance they have that they can grow their population numbers, right? So leafhoppers are really, you know, expected to increase in population and really benefit from warming. Plants, on the other hand, like tea plants, are not predicted to benefit as much from warming. Um, I mentioned before the tea plant is pretty resilient to warming. It grows in pretty warm places. Um, but at really extreme temperatures, any plant is going to wilt, right? Um, and when it wilts, it's not growing, it's not doing photosynthesis. Um, and so what you might have here is kind of a double whammy. You get more leaf hoppers, less growth of the tea plant equals much, much higher densities of leaf hoppers per leaf or per young shoot or however you want to count it. And so a lot of my work has been on how the effect of, or how, how that's going to happen, right? How is the weather going to affect the leafhopper populations? And then how are the, those leafhopper densities going to affect the tea? And one of the neat things that I found in my research um, that I'm uh, still, uh, well, actually, I just submitted the paper recently, so that's good. Um, so it's in the pipeline, um, but something that's still, you know, shaping up, it's not published yet. Um, but it's this, uh, what we found was that as the leafhopper density, as it, as it increases on these plants, there's kind of a point where it changes, where something changes in the leaf chemistry. There's a natural kind of switch point. It's not just this simple dose dependent response, more leafhoppers, you know, more floral smells, right? It's better. Um, there's a point where something changes. And so it's, it's not, my, my experiment didn't follow this all through to finished tea, so I can't say a whole lot about quality for sure. I can sort of make some guesses. Um, but yeah, after that point, you start to get more of certain chemicals that are, that are kind of don't have desirable uh, aromas, things that have kind of uh, green vegetal aromas, um, or kind of uh, one of them that I found in there has sort of like a mushroomy aroma. Um, and so there's, there's maybe actually an upper limit where you actually, farmers maybe don't want too much leafhopper damage because it might actually be bad for the quality of the tea. Um, I don't know what it's like in, in Taiwan, but in Fujian province, when I ask farmers, you know, do you ever get too many leafhoppers? Um, they all, all the farmers I talked to there said, no, we want more, <laughs> bring them on, more leafhoppers. You know, we can make better Eastern Beauty Oolong if we have more leafhoppers. Um, but that, that might not be the case. Um, especially if the tea plants are stressed from other, other, for other reasons that could affect the chemistry. Um, and speaking of being stressed in other ways, another study that I worked on as part of my PhD was looking at the interactions between different aspects of climate change. So I mentioned drought already, and I mentioned insects just now. And so what happens if you put them together? <laughs> How do plants respond when they get both of those things at once? Um, and there are good reasons to predict uh, it could go sort of one of two ways. Um, you, could, you could make a good argument that, well, if plants are already stressed by drought, then when they get hit by insects, they're going to be ready and they're going to be ready to boost up their defense chemistry um, even higher than they would if they just got hit by insects alone, right? They're going to be primed. They're going to be ready to go because they're already stressed and they're already sort of uh, on the edge, ready to go. Um, or you can make the argument that the tea plants are spending all these resources dealing with drought, uh, protecting themselves from drought, and so they're not going to have anything left to deal with insect attack, right? So which one is it? Well, it turns out that um, under really high levels of drought, 
plants are not able to respond to insect attack as well. So this was, full disclosure, this experiment didn't use real insects. It used a hormone that researchers use, they spray on plants often to sort of mimic insect attack. It's called methyl jasminate. It's the smell of jasmine tea actually, um, or it's one of the smells in jasmine tea. But it's also a plant hormone that is involved in, in when plants respond to attack by insects. So I use that on drought, drought uh, tea plants that experience drought. And those tea plants were not as, as well able to handle the methyl jasminate, or they didn't really change, I guess is what I'll say, is they didn't really change their chemistry much at all. Plants that were less affected by drought um, were able to respond. So it may be that this bug bitten tea strategy only works when your plants are not drought stressed. Um, it may be that if plants are already experiencing some other form of stress, either from drought or heat, or flooding or whatever it is, um, it may be that they are less able to respond to insects, um, which is not great for a couple of reasons, right? One is it's, it's not improving the flavor of the tea in the way that the leafhoppers are supposed to, um, but it also you know, is probably bad for the plant because they're not able to protect themselves as well. Now, again, this was only done using methyl jasminate, uh, on, on teas experiencing drought. So I don't actually know the answer to all those questions that are related to that, um, but it sort of indicates that plants uh, experiencing multiple sources of stress might not be able to deal with all of them um, at the same time. So, um, so I think that the really important things sort of going forward in learning about how tea is being affected by climate change, um, one is gonna be thinking about those sort of indirect effects and the effects on not just you know the tea plant itself and the tea quality, but how it's going to affect production um, and how it's going to affect the the people that are involved in tea production as well. Um, so thinking about those indirect effects, but also thinking about the interactions and the multiple sources of stress that that tea plants are going to experience, um, and how they're going to be able to cope with multiple kinds of stress. You know, monsoon rains plus insect damage. What does that do? Is there some insect in Yunnan province that might help uh, improve tea quality after monsoon rains? I don't know. Not that I know of. Um, I assume, you know, if there was something like that, tea farmers are smart and probably would have figured that out by now. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe there's something else. Uh, maybe there's something similar to the leafhopper sort of situation um, that is uh, able to sort of rescue tea quality in the summers, hot summers of uh, Taiwan and Fujian province. Um, so, uh, you know, is it all doom and gloom? Well, you know, not necessarily. Um, you know, one thing about, uh, climate warming is that tea production will probably be able to move further north. And because tea does grow at a pretty wide range of latitudes, my guess is the rain, my guess, this is, this is really just a guess. And I don't, I don't actually know, <laughs> but my guess, my sort of gut feeling is that tea production, the range is probably gonna expand rather than the whole thing moving, right? It's gonna be like this rather than like this. Now, at the bottom of that range, it, the, 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 the land there might become more appropriate for you know, lower quality commodity tea. Whereas at the top, we might get you know, new regions opened up for tea growing possibly. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom necessarily. And I think that this bug bitten tea thing is really amazing. This thing that, that Taiwanese farmers figured out, um, it is a really super cool model that it's possible that we could apply that to lots of other crops and, and it's a win-win situation, right? Less insecticides, good for those insects, uh, and good for the crop and good for the farmers. And that's something that, um, you know, is really good for everybody. And uh, maybe that's something that works for other crops too and something that I'm really interested in. Um, that's where I'm gonna end today. So that was my little uh, unprepared spiel on the impacts of climate change in tea, uh, on tea. And I'm sure that I missed things and uh, forgot things. And so if you have comments, you can leave them. Um, you, can, you can send me a message on Instagram or you can leave them on the YouTube video once it goes up. Um, uh, one last question, David asks, uh, will tea get more expensive as the range shifts north? I'm guessing that tea is just going to get more expensive overall. Um, 
I think it's probably going to be more of a function of, of uh, labor costs increasing than anything else is sort of my guess. Uh, but I'm not an economist, um, so I, I don't know for sure. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, if you uh, haven't, if this is your first Tea Science Tuesday that you've seen, um, I put them up on YouTube on the Tea Geek channel and uh, there's a playlist there and you can go see the ones that I've that I've done before and uh, please leave comments and ask questions and I'm happy to answer questions and all that and uh, until then I'll see you next Tuesday thanks for coming guys bye